During the teaching ministry of Dr. Lehman Strauss. From a lifetime of personal study, years in the pastorate and Bible conference ministry, Dr. Strauss offers instruction and encouragement from his teachings in the Word of God. And now, here's your Bible teacher, Dr. Lehman Strauss. Thank you for including Bible study time in your listening schedule today. It is a joy and a privilege to bring to you the ministry of the Word of God. It is an honor to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and a privilege to minister His Word. And I take this position today as we come once again with a message from the Word of God. Before we have our study in Galatians, there are two words I would like to take up today. They all, they both begin with the letter B. We are still in the B's in this alphabet of words and terms in the Bible. The word I want to consider first today is the word Belial, spelled B-E-L-I-A-L. -E the word means recklessness, wickedness, worthlessness. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we read, beginning with verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now it seems to me that the expression Belial here is a proper name for Satan. In the Old Testament, in Judges chapter 19, verse 22, and in chapter 20, verse 13, a son of Belial means a son of a reckless, wicked, worthless person. And so when you come across that name Belial in the Bible, always associate it with Satan. Now in contrast to that harsh word that appears in the Bible, Belial, we come to a more pleasant word. It is the word Baraka, spelled B-E-R-A-C-H-A-H. -A -H. The word Baraka means blessing. One of the thirty Benjamite warriors who assisted David at Ziklag when David was fleeing from Saul in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 3 contains that name, the name Baraka meaning blessing. And then there was a valley called the Valley of Baraka. It was between Bethlehem and Hebron where Jehoshaphat won a victory over the Amorites and Moabites and praised God for the blessing of the victory. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 26. In the city of Philadelphia, there is a church called the Baraka Church. And then after that church was started, a member of that church moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, began a work there, and he called that church the Baraka Church. So that in America, there are two outstanding churches that I know of by the name of the Baraka Church, one in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, one in Houston, Texas, and the name means the, the name means blessing or the valley of blessing. So the two words, Belial and Baraka, are our two word studies for today. We'll have other word studies in future programs. Now before we turn to Galatians for our study in chapter 5, beginning with verse 19, we're going to look to God in prayer. Loving Father, it is with thanksgiving and praise that we come to Thee once again in the name of our Lord Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. We thank Thee, Father, for the blessing which Thou hast given to us in Christ. We are in the valley of blessing, in the valley of Baraka. We are in the place where Thou hast put us, a valley of sin, but yet a place where we can know Thy blessing in its fullness. We look forward to the mountaintop when our Lord Jesus shall come, and his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives, and he shall establish his kingdom and reign from Jerusalem. Until that day, O God, help us to appropriate our spiritual blessings in Christ. Minister in a very special way to everyone who listens to this broadcast. 
And Father, we ask for a special blessing today for the elderly, for the shut-ins, for the infirmed, the hospitalized, those in rest homes, in institutions where they're being cared for for one disease or another, and those in their own homes on beds of sickness. Lord, may there be a special ministry through radio for them. These dear ones who cannot get out to travel, to attend church services, need thy blessing. Lord, use the radio today to bless their hearts. We pray for those who are struggling with problems and difficulties, marital problems, social problems, moral problems, financial problems. Lord, help thy children to turn to thee today, casting all their care upon thee, knowing that thou carest for them. And for any unsaved who might listen today, may they come to know our Lord Jesus Christ in a genuine and an experiential way. For we pray in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Now will you please open your Bible to Galatians chapter 5. And I want to read beginning with verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now you will recall in the 17th verse, Paul said, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. In other words, there's a conflict going on within the child of God. In verse 16, he said, Walk in the Spirit, or walk by means of the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust or the desire of the flesh. Then in verse 18, he says, But if ye be led by the Spirit, or led of the Spirit, ye are not under law. Now, in these verses, Paul is stressing the importance of a Spirit-controlled life. Walking by means of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit. But here, beginning with verse 19, he enumerates the works of the flesh. He gives a list of those works. In verse 16, he speaks of the lust of the flesh. Here it is, the works of the flesh. Now, in verse 16, Paul has in mind the inner motions of the soul, the natural tendency of men in their fallen condition toward e things evil and toward things that are forbidden. But here, beginning at verse 19, he describes the actual display of those inner motions in word and deed. How are these inner motions reflected in our daily behavior? A man's character is manifested in his works. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. A man can be no better outwardly than what he is inwardly. He can put on a good show outwardly. He can make pretense. But if he's not genuine on the inside, then the outside is a camouflage and makes that person a hypocrite. No man can hide his real self, actually. He may hide his lusts for a little while, but his works will soon be manifest. Notice what Paul says now. The works of the flesh are manifest. That is, they cannot be hidden. They are easily obvious, and they can be recognized. It is not difficult to distinguish between the man who fulfills the lust of the flesh and the man who is being led by the Spirit. While Paul's list of fleshly works is not complete, it is quite comprehensive in that it includes sensual sins, religious sins, social sins, and personal sins. Now, the following comments on the works of the flesh are pretty much as they appeared in a book that I wrote some years ago. Now, I've revised it, and the book is out of print, uh, so there's no need to ask for it. But I've revised it and updated it, and we're going to look at those sins now. The first one mentioned in verse 19 is the word adultery. What is adultery? Well, adultery is sexual unfaithfulness on the part of two persons when either of them is married to a third person. It seems difficult to believe that a Christian would be guilty of such a violation. Yet I know personally of just such cases at this time. And it affects not only the life of the pastor and of the local church, that is the spiritual condition of the church, but certainly it affects the people who are involved in it. 
Oh, how solemn are the words of our Lord Jesus. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 and verse 28. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is one of the flagrant sins of our day. Now you might expect godless people to become involved in this. But when church members and professing Christians become involved, this is a tragedy. It is a sin that God condemns. I know the standards are being lowered in our day. I know that sexual uh, promiscuity and permissiveness are popular today. X-rated movies and pornography and uh, all of this being shown on television from time to time. I'm well aware of this, but my friend, the Bible has not changed and God has not lowered his standards. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is a work of the flesh. It is tragic not only to hear of Christians becoming involved in this, but occasionally we hear of a minister, a minister of the gospel becoming involved in adultery. Now, none of us are immune from the temptation. Uh, none of us can expect to be free from ever being tempted. But, dear friends, Jesus said, Don't look to lust. Whosoever looketh, that's present continuous tense in Matthew 5.28. He who continues to look and continues to lust and says, I would if I could. That person is guilty of adultery in the heart. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now the works of the flesh are these, adultery. Secondly, he speaks of fornication. How does fornication differ from adultery? I understand fornication to be the sexual relationship that is the incontinence or the lewdness of unmarried persons. Though shocking, yet it is true that a fundamental pastor says he has officiated already at a number of forced marriages. Now, of course, not until after he had dealt with both couples in the light of God's word. Sometimes I wonder how many couples walk down the aisle and stand at the marriage altar. She is dressed in lovely white. Her friends come to view her and uh, say, My, what a lovely girl. What a fine Christian girl he's getting. And yet the person has been guilty of fornication. Oh, if you're listening to me today and you're a young person, keep your body clean. It belongs to God. Your body is God's by redemptive right as well as by creative right. God created your body. God redeemed your body. If you are a young person listening to this broadcast, may I say to you, young lady, that your body does not belong to the young man who dates you. And young man, your body does not belong to the young girl whom you're dating, nor does hers belong to you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Keep your body clean. Now I am not suggesting to you that sex is a dirty word. It is not. Sex is of God. God created two sexes. And when he created the male and the female, he put them together as husband and wife, and he said, now be fruitful and multiply, but keep it for the marriage bed. Outside of the marriage bed, it does not only have God's disapproval, but it will meet with God's judgment. Adultery and fornication are works of the flesh. Avoid them. Thirdly, Paul mentions uncleanness. Now, how does uncleanness differ from uh, adultery and fornication. Well, uncleanness is uncleanness in any thought or word or deed of impurity or in any lewdness. Sometimes we can be unclean in our thoughts. And I'm sure that we all have had this, where unclean thoughts have entered into our minds. I can recall on one occasion while I was in prayer, an unclean thought came into my mind. Now, in order to keep your mind clean, it is good to saturate it with the Word of God. The Christian who takes time daily to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to memorize portions of the Bible, will find that his mind is being controlled by the Word of God. You see, if we are not filling our mind with holy things, a vacuum is created. And what will creep into that vacuum 
is the work of the flesh, the unclean thoughts. So let's keep our minds clean by saturating them with good things and holy things. Paul gives to us in his Philippian epistle a list of things we should think upon. Think upon things that are good and holy and right and just and good. Think kindly of people. Don't let uncleanness control your thoughts. If uncleanness does not control our thoughts, then uncleanness will not control our deeds or our words. The next word that Paul uses is lasciviousness. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. A person who acts without regard or restraint in a brutish and lustful desire is a lascivious person. Webster's Dictionary defines lasciviousness as looseness, irregular indulgence of animal desires. I think it's tragic, nevertheless true, that human beings are devoted to the gratification of the senses or the indulgence of a lewd and a voluptuous appetite. Oh, beloved Christians, we cannot be controlled by lasciviousness. Again, we have to let the Word of God control us. Let the Word of God dwell in you, Colossians 3.16 says, abundantly, freely. We can never get too much Bible. This is why this broadcast is devoted to the ministry of the Word of God. It is impossible for a believer to get too much of the Word of God. We can get too much of a lot of other things, but we can never get too much of God's holy word. The next word Paul uses is in verse 20. It's the word idolatry. Now, in a strict sense, idolatry is the worship of a deity in a visible form, whether the image worshipped is the symbol of the true God or of a false God. Golden calves, fetishes, the sun, the moon, stars, these all may be objects of idolatry, but Paul is not referring to these ancient forms of idol worship. He's concerned with another kind of idolatry which is just as destructive and devastating. It is that little God which relegates the Lord Jesus Christ to a secondary place in the believer's life. It may be an automobile or an ambition. It may be a position or a pleasure. It may be politics or people. It may be a loved one or a friend or a business associate. Whatever is placed in our affection before God becomes an object of idolatry. Now, what is your first consideration? What is my first love? Are we so utterly abandoned to the lover of our souls, the Lord Jesus, that he receives first consideration in our lives? If not, then we are carnal. We can be considered idolatrous Christians. Now, idolatry is not confined to wearing some kind of a, uh, an image around your neck on a chain or having one on a lapel of your coat or hung up somewhere in the uh, bedroom or some other room of your house. Let's be very careful about that. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 that covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. Put it away. It's idolatry. If we covet what God does not want us to have, that makes us idolaters. Yes, idolatry can creep into the life of a child of God. The next word Paul uses is witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Well, dealing with the practice of evoking spirits in order to produce results which apparently, seemingly, are supernatural. That, in substance, is witchcraft. It is this element in the flesh that leads some children of God to teacup readers, palmists, spiritists, mediums, fortune tellers, crystal ball gazers, the tarot card, the Ouija board, when they ought to be consulting the word of God and be consulting God in prayer. I have known Christians to refuse to walk under a ladder or to raise an umbrella in a house or to spit when a black cat crosses their path. Other people carry rabbit's feet or miniature horseshoes. Others cross their fingers when they're making a decision. Beloved, these things ought not to be in the life of the child of God. I ask a Christian why she spit when a black cat crossed her path. Well, she said, it's for good luck. Dear friends, we don't trust luck. We trust the Lord. Any child of God who has to trust luck by refusing to trust his loving Heavenly Father is guilty of carnality. 
and it's it, and is guilty before God of minding the things of the flesh. It is carnal. It is fleshly. It is worldly to become involved in these things. And let me add that this includes astrology, which is condemned in the word of God. Astrology is not of God. We do not look to the stars for guidance. We look to the God who put the stars there. How much better to look to the creator of the heavens and the earth rather than to the heavenly bodies themselves. Let's not become involved in witchcraft in any form. If we are men and women of the word of God, we'll be looking to the scriptures and looking to God in prayer. All the counsel you need about the unseen spirit world, about your departed loved ones, you'll find it within the confines of God's holy word. Read and study your Bible daily. There you will come to grips with the great facts of life. Paul goes on to mention the next work of the flesh. He calls it hatred. What is hatred? Well, the word means antipathy, aversion, abhorrence. To hate is to dislike or to detest another person. A Christian who is horrified at another person's sin of adultery, fornication, idolatry, or uncleanness often nurtures a dislike against another Christian. They have a hatred in their hearts against another Christian. Oh, they wouldn't commit adultery. They wouldn't be guilty of fornication. You couldn't accuse them of idolatry. You couldn't say they're unclean. But they sure can hate somebody else. Now, my dear friend, if you're listening to my voice, and that's you, let me say that you are guilty of manifesting the deeds of the flesh, just as guilty as the adulterer or the fornicator or the idolater. God does not distinguish or differentiate between these deeds of the flesh. They are related to each other and are contrary to the law of love. They are contrary to a heart devoted to God. Then following the word hatred, Paul deals with that word variance. Again, the Christian worker is guilty before God. Oftentimes we find some of the choicest servants of the Lord who can be charged with causing discord or dissension among brethren. This is not right. It is carnal, it is fleshly, it is worldly. Don't be a troublemaker. It's better to keep your mouth shut and not discuss the problems and the sins of other people than to go around being a troublemaker and being guilty of variance, causing dissension among the children of God. We Christians are to strive to maintain love and peace and fellowship among the saints of God. This should be one of our aims from day to day. I have a dear friend in whom you will never find him discussing the weakness and the sins of other people. If you start gossiping in his presence, he just won't talk to you. He'll not answer you. He'll freeze you. And you'll be so ashamed of yourself, you'll soon shut your mouth. It's good not to be able to be guilty of variance. Then here's the word emulation. What does it mean? Well, I think it means competition or rivalry. Because of jealousy, some Christians strive to equal or surpass the achievement of another Christian. That means you're carnal. If I'm guilty of that, it means that I am fleshly. I am worldly. We should never covet another person's gift. We should never be jealous of another person's gift. Let us thank God for each other's gifts. Let each use his own gift to the glory of God and not be jealous of another Christian. I am not in competition with any other radio broadcaster who's teaching and preaching the word of God. I have friends who are in the radio ministry and I pray for them. I love them and I pray that their work will prosper and that God will send in the sufficient funds to keep them on the air. If I have any other attitude, then I'm guilty of emulation and God would not bless my efforts. Beloved, we cannot be jealous of one another. Now you'll find a Christian who has a gift that you don't have. Well, you pray for that person. You use the gift that God has given you. If I find a Christian with a gift that I don't have, I want to learn something from that person. After all, we can learn from one another. And if we're too big to learn from one another, I think we're just too big, period. We better become a little smaller in our own eyes and be willing to learn something from every man. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. God helped me to learn something from every person. Let's not be guilty of emulation. We are not in a contest. We are not in competition with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The next word is wrath. This means violent anger, vehement exasperation, a raging resentment. 
Too often we have seen this prisoner break forth within and angrily attack another person. And when I see a Christian who's really fired with hot anger, with wrath, it frightens me. Beloved, it tells me that if that person is really saved, they know nothing of a spirit-controlled life. They are being controlled by the flesh. The next word is strife. Not a few pastors must take valuable time to referee a contest for superiority between two other Christians, each of whom claims super spirituality, but they are as fleshly as the first Adam himself after he fell. Beloved, we ought not to be striving with one another. We ought to be striving against sin, against Satan, against the spirit of this world, but we Christians cannot strive with each other. Then he uses the word sedition. A sedition is a factious commotion within the church of Christ, making for insurrection and rebellion. It causes what is commonly known as church splits. It always arises from within a carnal or a fleshly Christian, for sedition is called a deed of the flesh. Don't be a church splitter. Don't create problems in your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your church. And then he has the word heresies here. This is any school of thought which is contrary to the recognized fundamental doctrines of our historic Christian faith. Are you guilty of any of these works of the flesh? I trust not. Well, our time is up. We're just able to deal with this word heresies, and we'll take up with verse 21 in our next study.